life better. Not necessarily a physical life better, but he was trying to get people to understand that life is only a beginning and that if you will listen, if you follow him, if you will love him, action love him, that he promises you that your spiritual life will be the greatest reward that you'll ever have of anything in this world and in the life to come. We sing songs about heaven, but do they really sink into our heart to where it pursues us to live peaceably with all, all mankind, to love each other, and to show each other that we love each other, and to make life better for people that we come in contact with along the way? Are we going to have disagreements along the way? You bet we will. Are we going to disagree on unimportant things? You bet we will. But that should never deter us from the love that we are commanded to show in the Bible one with another. We can disagree and that's okay. But we're commanded to not let anything separate us from the love of God and from our commitment to love each other. That's why we call each other in the church brothers and sisters. Because that's what we are. By the blood of Jesus Christ, we are a blood-bought family come together. And that should be our relationship one with another. Love brings unity. Unity is something that maybe we need to teach more about in the church. What really binds us together as a family? Certainly, it's not our personality traits, because as I look out over this audience of those of you that I know, we are definitely all different personalities. All of us unique in our own way. I think it would be safe to say that we are not united, uh, brought together by our political views. Uh, boy, there's a hornet's nest, isn't it? It's not our socioeconomic Standing, But the thing that binds us together is Jesus Christ. That's what we have in common. That's what we share. We are brothers and sisters because we are children of God. The book of Psalms, chapter 133 and verse 1 says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. And that we are called to be united. Unity strengthens, division weakens. And I want us to be strong. You know, I come from the state of Kentucky, don't boo. But on the flag of the state of Kentucky seal are the words, United we stand and divided we fall. And I believe that that is carried over in the Lord's church. Now, if you have your Bibles... Can you hear me if I walk away from this microphone? Or we're not recording, are we? We are. You got a cord you got a cordless? Either throw it or run it or whatever. In first John chapter one. There are seven spiritual guarantees. Now you're already thinking, man, seven? If you need to stand up, then go ahead. I'll understand. There are seven spiritual guarantees that are here that I believe that we need to take to heart in our lives. That I believe that these things will help us as we strive for unity, as we strive to maintain a love relationship with each other within the church. Thank you. There's no clip. Yeah, you want to hold it and walk around with me? I'm good. And these spiritual, can you hear me? Okay. These spiritual guarantees that I believe are, are more than just characteristics, they're more than just qualities. I believe this is a formula for each one of us to have in our life. The first one, uh, let's look at verse 5. Verse 5 of chapter 1 of 1 John. Verse 5, chapter 1, verse John. 
This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Look at verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What a beautiful thought. Walk in the light. Well, what is the light? You know, nobody likes to walk around in darkness. I'm a, I don't like the darkness. I like to be able to see. Walking in the light is walking in Jesus Christ because He is the light. And the greatest thing about that is that last part that we read. By walking in the light and living a faithful life and, and, and being a Christian is that Jesus Christ cleanses us from a few sins? What's it say there? All sin. So the first spiritual guarantee there is that we need to walk in the light. Are you walking in the light this morning in your life? In other words, let me put it this way. Do you think and do you carry Christ in your heart every day? Does He help you make decisions? Do you pray to Him? Do you pray for guidance? Is He the first thing you think of in the morning and the last thing you think of at, at night? Do you carry Him in your life every day of your life? That's walking in light. The second one is verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Number two, confess our sins. Brethren, I was always taught or in some way implied in my life, not by my parents, I don't know where I picked this up, But if you admitted that you had a fault, that it meant you were weak. And I'll confess to you right now, it's taken me a long time to kind of let the wall down for people to realize that I'm just as human as everybody else. And I have faults. And I sin. And I don't always do the right thing. And I don't always say the right thing. But having a heart of confession. Is having a heart of strength. It doesn't mean you're less of a person. It means you're better of a person. It means you are focused on walking in the light. And that you want to be considered with the righteous and not with the unrighteous. And folks, the idea that we can go through life and not ever be wrong is absolutely wrong. And if you think that right now, there's your first wrong of the day. You cannot always be right. Nobody's always right. Nobody knows everything. We all have people we look up to. We like to think they're the smartest people that, I, that we know. But nobody knows everything. I think Andy's a genius. He knows a lot about a lot of things. And when Andy talks, I listen. But Andy doesn't know everything. And it's okay sometimes for him to look at me and say, I don't know. And it's the same way in my relationship with the church. And in my relationship with God. I'm not perfect. We're not perfect. And it's okay to confess that. And that's one of the seven spiritual guarantees. Number three, verse three, verse three of chapter two. I'm hurrying, I promise. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. He was our great example. 
And that we see here the idea that we're supposed to obey His commandments. I'm still working on that lesson. I've narrowed it down. It may take us four weeks to do it, but we're getting ready to do it in the future. What does that mean? Do you ever wonder what are the commands of, of the Bible? Okay, we've got love God. We know that one. We've got love thy neighbor as yourself. We've got that one, right? Do you know how many specific commands there are in the New Testament? Or have you even ever thought about it? God, God expects a lot of it from us, doesn't he? And here, one of these spiritual guarantees that if you want to be right with God, then you're going to obey those commands. Was that three or four? That was three. All right, let's go to four. Verse nine, he who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. How can you say you love God and hate your brother? If you say you love God and hate your brother, the love of God is not in you. How great of a spiritual guarantee is that in our relationship with each other within the church? It's not always roses. It's not always perfect. Sometimes there are rough patches in the road. But it never takes away or deflates from our responsibility to love those who are our brethren in the church. And that when we look at each other, we're not looking for perfection. We're looking for hard workers who are trying. Who are trying. Who knows that we're going to slip up along the way. And I don't love you any less. And you're not supposed to love me any less when it just doesn't go just right. Now understand, I'm talking about relationships in the church. I'm not talking about doctrine. I'm not talking about those spiritual, scriptural matters in the Bible. We know how we're supposed to worship. The Bible tells us so. We know what, how salvation comes. And that's through baptism uh, in the blood of Jesus Christ, through immersion in the watery grave of baptism. That's not we're talking about things like that. We're talking about as a family. How many of you have the perfect family outside of church? If you've got the perfect family, raise your hand. Whoa, What? Really? So you all have got one of those crazy uncles too. That perfect family doesn't really exist. Let me tell you a story about an uncle of mine. And I'm so glad my mom's not here because she would cringe. This was an uncle that married into the family. Uh, he is now dead. But I'll tell you this, he spent 25 years in prison. Okay, now that's not funny. But he spent 25 years in prison because he was running a stolen car racket. He would get a car that had been totaled. He would go steal a car that matched it and put the good numbers on the good car and turn around and sell it as a new car. And the FBI watched him for two years and when it showed up one day, took a bulldozer up behind his house and dug up all of these cars. I'm proud of that. No, I'm not. We all have families where there were some things in our closet we'd just like to keep there. But the family here at this place, look around this morning. We're not perfect either. But if you have the blood of Jesus Christ that has washed you from your sins, you're perfect in his eyes. And I'm going to tell you something. That's all that matters. When this life is over, you're going to answer to him, not me. When this life is over, I'm going to answer to him, not you. Now, I trust you. But I certainly don't want you to judge me. And you certainly don't want me to judge you. But he who is righteous. 
will judge us. I told Pat right before she went to surgery, Bob sitting there holding her hand. You know, there's not a lot of words in a situation like that. The fear of the unknown. We had a prayer with her, and as I walked out of the room, I just grabbed her by the toe. It's the only thing that didn't have a wire stuck in it. <laughs> and I said, Pat, remember this. I'm Bob, I hope you remember this. God will have the last word, and it will be good. Brethren, if you get nothing else from this story or this sermon, if you get nothing else from the meeting that we had earlier, please get that. That God will always have the last word and it will be. You say it. Good. And that's the way it's going to be. Verse 15. Chapter 2, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. The world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Very quickly, a uh, spiritual guarantee here is do not love this world. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. My home's laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Do not love the world or the things of this world. Number six, the last verse of this chapter. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Righteousness is simply right living. Right living not by the world's standards, but right living by the standards given to us in the Bible. And the way to live right according to the Bible this morning, if you're here and you've never obeyed the gospel, to start on that right step going in the right direction is to do what the Bible has commanded us to do. That is to repent of the sin that we have in our lives, to make the confession that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and put him on in baptism. And to have your sins washed white as snow. Then we have started out on that journey of righteousness. To living the righteous life. And then we can think and long and hope for that eternal home. Folks, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to lie to you. It's been tough the last couple of weeks. It's been hard. It's been hard because of the love that we have for this congregation. It's been hard because of the love that we have for the church. I'm talking about the institution of the church and keeping it, keeping it holy. And it's been hard because it's never easy to go through something challenging. But the great thing about it, as with any challenge we go through in life, we come out stronger on the other side. Are you with us today? Are we united as a congregation of the Lord's body? Those apostles, as they went about establishing congregations, loved their church, the Lord's church, so much that they would have defended it with their own lives. Brethren, I've been here only four short years. Some of you have been here all of your life. But I hope you feel as strong as I do. I will defend the sanctity and the unity and the love of this church with my very life.
I love you all. These elders love you all. Our deacons love you all. If we can help you this morning in any way, won't you come as we stand and sing?